My name is Tim McCormick. I'm the editor-in-chief of the uh, Maryland Journal of International Law. And I'm uh, pleased to introduce our keynote lecturer, uh, Henry Richardson. Uh, Henry Richardson is a graduate of Yale Law School with an LLM from uh, UCLA. And became uh, an inter uh, after graduating from, uh, with a JD from uh, Yale, he became an international legal advisor to the government of Malawi uh, shortly, after it, uh, shortly after its independence for, more than uh, for two years where he advised on inherited treaties and a range of Southern African international legal negotiations and questions. Uh, after that, he, uh, went and he returned to the U.S. to earn his LLM at, the, uh, at UCLA with a focus in international law and development in Africa. He was active in several anti-apartheid groups relative to international law. From 1977 to 1979, he has served on the National Security Council's, uh, he served on the National Security Council staff in charge of African policy uh, and the United Nations uh, during the Carter administration. Uh, he's subsequently been senior, uh, senior foreign policy advisor to the Congressional Black Caucus and attorney with the Office of the General Counsel for the Department of the Defense. Professor Richardson joined the, uh, became a professor at Temple Law School in 1981. He's published many, uh, many scholarly articles and is the co-founder of Temple University's International and Comparative Law Journal. Uh, he's a, currently, he serves as a member of the Council of Foreign Relations. Uh, Council of Foreign Relations. Uh, he's a past vice president and honorary vice president of the American Society of International Law and a founding member of both the National Conference of Black Lawyers and the Project on the Advancement of African Americans in International Law. And I'm pleased to have him uh, give our keynote address. Shortly after his address, Professor Van Alstine has agreed to uh, provide a brief response, and then we're going to open up the floor to uh, question and answer. Without further ado, Professor Richards. Thank you indeed, Tim. I am uh, most honored to be here and to have been invited to participate in this discussion. I'm particularly pleased to be in the precincts of my good friend, the Dean Phoebe Haddon, to have been invited by my good friend Maxwell, Professor Maxwell Chibundu, um, and other friends here at the law school. I appreciate uh, Professor Van Alstine's willingness to uh, indeed comment on um, whatever I might say. Uh, that assumes that everybody will be in the room still. Um, our current inquiry about intervention must start with the global community. It's a community in the comprehensive empirical factual linkages and intersecting processes sense among all peoples in the world. We can only affirm that we now are living in McLuhan's global village of simultaneous communications and claims to norms. Necessary questions arise from the global village. The intense actual and value link processes defining the global community present us as Maxwell, as, as McDougall, Laswell, and Reisman began to discuss a half century ago with the inescapable responsibility of identifying the constitutive process of this community. That is, the flow of decisions which establishes, maintains, adjusts, and changes the institutions and procedures by which all other decisions are taken. On this basis, actors in processes of more specific decisions allocate basic values such as power, wealth, rights, loyalty, and authority, and the access to global resources. In this regard, in any human community, there is always governance, though it may well rest on patterns of Hobbesian banditry and Machiavellian contingency in unfamiliar non-institutionalized arrangements. As scholars, we have the responsibility to identify and understand this global constitutive process. And in exercising this responsibility, we confront a major question about the current law of the global community because there will inevitably be law on the constitutive level. The major constitutive question for international law in our global village 
is whether, as a dynamic legal process of authority and control, it will, in its decisions, interpretations, and large range of actors, simply reflect the dominant patterns of power and control that arise from unappraised sources in the village, or whether its decisions and interpretations will normatively aim to steadily shape a better global community towards greater sharing of human values, more protection of personal rights, less conflict, and more cooperation towards human dignity. This jurisprudential question continues today to be one of great tension and camouflage. But this question underpins our discussion today on intervention under international law. Whether international law will simply bless existing intervention patterns of global power and practice, unilateral or collectively authorized, or whether as a legal system it will define norms to meet the responsibility under Article 13.2 of the UN Charter of fostering truly the progressive development of international law. And from this constitutive question we must ask whether regarding intervention, However we define it, international law has ceased to reflect and bless the raw patterns of power, domination, subordination, and race that it did structure and bless for some four centuries prior to confirming the formal illegality of European and other colonialism in the 20th century. Anthony Angie and other scholars have shown that colonial aims and doctrines persist to the point where current international law at the constitutive level continues to be racialized as between northern tier peoples and states pursuing various versions of an imperial project and racialized other peoples and states in the southern tier and also towards such diasporic peoples in the northern tier within the north's own territories and cities. Colonial conquest, its mobilization of law and institutions to serve dominating policies, and its permitted military force to conquer and induce southern peoples and leaders under the tent of empires, represent the first pertinent global model of intervention, a model of manipulated and purposeful penetration of foreign peoples and their cultures backed by military force and rationalized subordination. These were the global precedents and strategies that fixed the claims to authority to intervene as a global dynamic moving from the northern tier to and against southern peoples. Today there is a heavy burden on all who would argue that this colonial dynamic in international law has become so neutralized and equitable as to no longer shape meaningful north-south narratives and analysis about authoritative intervenors and strategies. Included here is the further question of how authority, jurisprudence, and process are to be globally allocated regarding decisions and influence about the formation of international law on intervention-related issues. Whoever controls or strongly affects the jurisprudence of international law formation does so as well for the major allocations of legal authority and justice in the global village, including under progressive interpretations of the UN Charter. Let us also note that under the Charter, the use of military force is conventionally authorized only by Article 51 on self-defense and by the collective authority of the Security Council, the latter being the principal legal avenue for most significant military intervention. But we also must note the Charter's reaffirmation of the constitutive doctrine of the sovereign equality of states and its legal significance for the decolonization movement, which I'll discuss in a minute. We must further note, regarding state intentions at its San Francisco negotiating conference, the opposition of Western states led by the United States to making clear in its text that the Charter outlawed colonialism and racism against colonized peoples, leaving the confirmation of these prohibitions to emerge later under international law. And finally, what homage should be paid the Charter's domestic jurisdiction clause, which was so abused by South Africa to protect apartheid, and by, for example, France to preserve colonial dominion over Algeria until better legal interpretation prevailed? <laughs> 
Additionally, we note proposed charter interpretations allowing the unilateral use of force for humanitarian intervention as a permissive principle of customary international law. This doctrinal claim had both pre- and post-charter history in supporting northern arguments to intervene in southern states to rescue the former citizens threatened there with harm. This doctrine has been much abused, including in the definition of citizens expanding to European kith and kin as empowering rescue interventions by any European state and incorporating the general practice of invoking the doctrine for supposed rescue missions while the intervening troops, once in country, tended also to modify the local governance of the state more towards European interests. All in all, this, this history frames a significant question on intervention. It concerns the conventional interpretation of the Charter that it changed international law by restricting the use of unilateral force only to self-defense, now including anticipatory self-defense under Caroline case limitations, and the use of force otherwise only to Security Council authorization. The question is, what if any acceptable international legal and policy basis can be claimed to add additional permissions under the Charter to legalize further unilateral uses of military force for any kind of intervention? Lastly, we know that intervention is an ambiguous legal term, especially in the global village. There are many diplomatic, ideological, cyber technic, economic, paramilitary, and military strategies of various intensities. Indeed, the very notion of intervention calls for an interrogation of the authority and the sovereignty of the state beyond the limits of this lecture. I will discuss some of these intervention strategies, for example, relating to human rights, while others, such as northern policies of nation building and of premature recognition of governments or non-military violations of Article 2.4 of the Charter will be omitted. And I will discuss military intervention. When deployed, it threatens the widest range of immediate damage to human rights and values. But occasionally, unfortunately, its proper deployment is necessary as an initial strategy to prevent or mitigate an impending human rights catastrophe. As will be discussed, the procedures, aims, and legal authority for such deployment are as important as the military action and its consequences. From this introduction, I will now briefly address the following questions regarding intervention. The power of human rights, the importance of the Nicaragua case, the critical importance of the global decolonization movement and its insufficiency to prevent the march of colonial aims into post-colonial international law. Counterterrorism, global policy, failed states, and intervention as claimed self-defense. The UN Security Council as an international lawgiver, the need to interrogate its decision process as a bulwark of northern racializing of law and its authority over regional organizations. R2P, and a final proposal addressing the issue of R2P and unilateral military intervention. The rise of human rights law produced an international legal obligation on states and others to protect the rights of individuals amidst their conduct of international relations and states and amidst their relations with their own peoples within their own territories. For the first time, a duty on states emerged directly under international law to protect individuals' human rights amidst even the most intense state claims of traditional sovereign initiatives and prerogatives. This duty supports, inter alia, a, a general international obligation to look inside of each state regarding the protection of its people's rights a duty for all states towards all peoples, and at a minimum, a duty to report and expose significant threats from that host state to the rights of peoples within its borders. But as Twale scholars note, this duty demands two further interrogations. First, of the authoritarian conditions within post-colonial northern and southern states. Second, of the abuse by northern states of this duty to protect human rights abroad 
by carrying forward proto-colonial civilizing goals to save those peoples from themselves, even by the use of military force to intervene and control those governments. The principle of protecting individual human rights is now obligatory. It must now be invoked by states and non-state actors in a variety of situations. Thus, basic issues of human decency and harm to persons must be addressed in the global village through all of its intersecting value processes. Among the international actors obligated to invoke the human rights protection of people in particular situations are those states, the majority in the northern tier, which are most equipped to intervene in southern states by diplomatic, economic, ideological, and military means and thus must implement their national policies under their human rights obligations. Hence, this is the new power of human rights regarding intervention in foreign states. Now let me discuss the Nicaragua case, 1984 contentious case before the ICJ. It raised clear issues under classical non-intervention doctrine the unconsented hostile mining of Nicaragua's harbor by American covert forces, the funding and command of proxy paramilitary forces from El Salvador across Nicaraguan borders to oppose its government. Our attention is drawn to first, the international relations context of this case, and second, to the theory under customary law of the ICJ's majority opinion, which upheld the continuing authority of the non-intervention doctrine under international law. On the first, with Nicaragua finding a treaty basis to establish ICJ jurisdiction over the United States, notwithstanding U.S. counter strategies aiming to avoid that result, by consenting to that jurisdiction, the court put itself at a stark crossroads at that moment in the international community. In facing the massive weight of the United States in its undeclared war against Nicaragua on one side and the grounded claims of sovereign equality and authority of the non-intervention doctrine by Nicaragua on the other, the ICJ in a grand sense through whatever its jurisprudence and best interpretation of international law regarding liability between these states, had to choose whether this case should be decided under embedded propositions of international relations or under embedded doctrines of international law. The international relations case would stand on propositions embedded in the field's general scholarship for a few generations. Namely, that this was a clear case of a regional hegemonic state moving through its own power to impose regional discipline under its own public order goals against smaller states in its own and globally acknowledged regional backyard or sphere of influence. The rise of this and other hegemonic states at various points in history was necessary to prevent interstate conflict from getting out of hand and to impose needed public order in various parts of the globe. Thus, not only were there strong factual historical indicators that such hegemonic states periodically emerged to exercise their hegemony, but there were normative perspectives that argued such organizing and coercion of smaller states as beneficial to the global good. For the United States as an inter-American hegemon, practices of its exercising interventionary hegemony to the, in the region for ensuring democracy and prompt payment of debts stretched back to the first half of the 19th century and then forward in new definitions to address its perceptions of a socialist government in Nicaragua. In this regard, the international relations propositions pose the challenge to post-World War II, post-colonial international law of whether that legal system must find some doctrine and interpretation among its sources of authority to bless and legalize the policies and discipline of the hegemonial state when it chooses to intervene in its own backyard. Indeed, this was the basic argument of the United States in this case, presented as an assertion of sovereign prerogative to intervene regarding both its attempted manipulation of the ICJ's jurisdiction and its subsequent futile attempt to absent itself from the merits proceedings. But Nicaragua was standing on a different foundation. It rested its case on the UN charter-affirmed principle of sovereign equality of states, 
historically a principle of both international relations and international law, and on the doctrine of non-intervention is not only reaffirmed in the UN Charter, but finding strong underpinnings and expressions arising from the states of inner America as a legal response to the very same hegemonial activities of the United States during the previous century. Reinforced by treaty and regional organization findings and declarations in the name of the Americas, the doctrine of non-intervention in its military expression existed as a living bundle of expectations under regional and general international law, and particularly for small states, notwithstanding that they could only rarely oppose such US military action when it occurred. <clears throat> Thus the ICJ faced, as a court of law but functioning in the actual world, the decision of whether this case was to be decided under international relations, albeit cloaked in legalisms, or under international law. And as we know, it decided upon the latter, thus incurring the immediate enmity of the legally thwarted United States. The notion that when international relations clashes with international law on questions of intervention, international law should prevail has clear ramifications for the authority of non-intervention doctrine in the global village. Further, the court's holding on non-intervention and customary law was, in a different way, equally significant. We see that the International Court of Justice here handed down a major decision against hegemonic subordination of small, regional, other states and peoples against the U.S. military intervention in Nicaragua. Its holding on international law formation was favorable to the South. The norm of non-intervention remains good law with only general state practice because of community opinion juris. Thus the notion of the violation of, non of the non-intervention norm was preserved and it was applied against U.S. military action against Nicaragua. The court faced with the choice of the claimed international relations authority to intervene of a hegemonic state and the international legal authority of the non-intervention norm as well as the norm of sovereign equality of states. By legal reasoning which accepted the customary law challenge of the case, chose to determine U.S. liability under international law. The subsequent anger of the United States certified the importance of the Nicaragua case. Let me move now to the global decolonization movement. This historic movement, coalescing in the 1950s through the 1970s, changed global politics and international law by adding some 140 sovereign states to the international community. It further revised the politics and authority of the United Nations and other international organizations. In its early post-colonial years, it mounted a formidable challenge through the UN General Assembly to northern normative legal and economic dominance of the global village. It reaffirmed the need to revise the international legal system and its jurisprudence towards the equitable participation of smaller states and southern peoples of color, and it invigorated notions of sovereign accountability under international law. Further. The decolonization movement challenged northern control and domination of the processes of international law formation, including through the UN General Assembly, including read the resolution on permanent sovereignty over natural resources and the Charter of Economic Rights and Duties of States, plus the rise of a body of southern tier oriented international legal scholarship. <clears throat> The movement represented a convergence of the newly confirmed Juice Kogan's right of self-determination of peoples and the doctrine of sovereign equality of states, which had to be applied to all of these new states under the UN Charter. This convergence, a principal outcome of decolonization, formed the refutation of rights claimed by ex-colonial metropolitans and other northern states to continue to intervene in their former colonies by economic and military strategies. <clears throat> but then came the northern counterattack to, re to regain jurisprudential and organizational dominance in the global village. Economic strategies against smaller states were coupled with periodic military interventions such as the periodic French incursions in French West Africa and the U.S. intervention in Vietnam under the thin guise of the doctrine of collective self-defense on which the Nicaragua case subsequently put important limits. <clears throat> 
In this period also arose the general northern tier aim to escape international legal accountability for the racial, economic, and cultural abuses of colonialism and apartheid, and where possible to shift any such liability to southern states by holding them strictly responsible for all events and misgovernance within their borders, no matter what their origins. In this connection, <clears throat> There was a notable refusal of northern governments to significantly intervene in the South African apartheid state and to make it impossible for the UN Security Council to do so. This northern refusal to other the apartheid state and to privilege its claimed Cold War interest to cooperate with Pretoria represent a privileging of northern racial solidarity with white South Africa against its black majority and implicitly against all African heritage peoples in the global village. In the United States, it took the historic African-American-led anti-apartheid movement to change U.S. foreign policy to more support the South African anti-apartheid struggle. Gernot Kohler's important jurisprudential proposal that law and lawmaking in the entire global village could accurately be reflected as a mirror of South African apartheid was a direct reflection of the inability of northern scholars to acknowledge race as a moving force in international relations, even given the brutal clarity of apartheid. It was further a reflection of the reasons and consequences of a pattern of confirmed northern decisions to refuse to intervene in apartheid South Africa, while being quite willing to do so elsewhere in the southern tier, and being quite willing to do so using heavy economic strategies upon the advent of post-apartheid South Africa in 1994. Thus, the global village saw the continuation in modern international law of old northern colonial doctrines to make political concessions on forms of southern state independence while continuing economic and periodic military intervention strategies, arguing their legality so as to leverage southern states from within their national territories and within their governments for the benefit of northern interests. We now move to brief remarks on counterterrorism and failed states. There appears to be a U.S. policy of mobilizing all national African militaries plus African Union regional authorized forces to U.S. counterterrorism aims. This is a new kind of great power intervention with induced consent of southern states under potential self-defense claims that descended on thin grounds from the global village post 9-11 2001 gift to the United States of a valid self-defense claim in inaugurating the Afghanistan war, a gift subsequently undermined by the 2003 Iraqi invasion. Thus, issues of whether counterterrorism overseas military strategies rest on self-defense or police enforcement rationales may be somewhat beside the point. Both seem to lead to attempts to legalize foreign northern preemptive military interventions in the south while failing so far to halt the now dispersed threat of global terrorism as attacks on innocent civilians. Further, there is a closely related question of whether unilateral interventions into failed states will be legalized as interventions into the renamed racial others Ruth Gordon has discussed the early 21st century proposed and demanded revitalization of the UN Trusteeship Council to be the global legal repository of desovereignized failed states, plus the demand to resolve the transitional international legal questions to make this happen. She's discussed this as the ultimate intervention. However, international law despite many northern scholarly proposals that it as a legal system should do so, and despite disputed arguments that U.S. counterterrorism policy may validly claim prerogatives of military intervention into failed states to preempt sources of terrorist threats, has not incorporated these demands and policy goals. It has particularly refused to incorporate a formally reduced standard of sovereignty for failed states that would permit greater military intervention into their territories. The International Court of Justice made this clear in its holding in the Congo versus Uganda case regarding Uganda's lack of special 
cross-border interventionary prerogatives into the Congo, notwithstanding the latter's index status as a failed state. In the same vein, other judicial holdings have refused to lower the threshold of state responsibility for, for example, Somalia as a failed state that would have mitigated criminal penalties for pirates sailing from its territory. This international legal refusal to diminish the sovereignty of failed states in the face of heavy northern official and scholarly demands that they be subject to forms of preemptive intervention, not limited by requirements to find imminent danger to the invading states, represents the more desirable legal policy. It holds the line against further racializing of international legal approaches to failed states when the very concept represents great racializing. And in doing so, as Jeremy Levitt discusses, it preserves space for the continued evolution of regional doctrines of obligations to assist failed states to resolve their problems, while prescribing obligations and rights protecting peoples within those states. Such examples arise in Africa under the African Union Treaty prescribing rights of democratic governance, of freedom from military coups, and rights to remedial regional assistance. Let me now move towards the UN Security Council. Much current scholarship on the legality of the use of force to intervene in states where human rights are threatened, where international crimes are being committed, or to bring democracy for wider regional or geopolitical purposes is focused on the UN Security Council, both as a lawgiver and as the preferred legal arena for these proposed actions. Many interim issues are raised, including the threatened council inaction in the face of widely agreed and credibly documented international crimes, for example, Syria, chemical weapons, and thousands of deaths. But for the moment, let me put those aside. The point is that the argued heightened legal necessity of Security Council approval throws an intense spotlight on the need for a new normative assessment of Security Council decision making beyond an analysis of its charter and other authority as essential to understanding current military interventions under international law. This need is framed on the one hand by the asserted role of the Council as the chief custodian of collective authority under international law and the most desirable source of legal permission to use force. And on the other hand, by the total lack of momentum towards any Security Council reform that would revise the procedures by which it as a charter body decides to allocate authority to member states and prescribe interpretations of international law. We are left, therefore, with the current narratives of council decision making, especially under Chapter 7 authority, that feature a domination subordination two tier system of P5 collaboration and debates to resolve veto abstention questions in that group, from which rotating council members are generally frozen out. There follows the polling and assembly of a council voting majority which often features applications of varying pressures by individual or several P5 members on smaller, more vulnerable rotating members to construct the voting majority for the proposed council decision. I suggest that this decision narrative can no longer be accepted as legally permissible and excusable exercises of northern sovereign autonomy and cross pressures within the council arena. This narrative falls under the classic Groschen axiom that we must not fail to normatively assess every significant act of international relations. In assessing the Council's decision process, we note certain continuing issues. We note the original charter intent that the P5 emerging as governmental directors of the world community out of World War II and also as declining metropolitans of threatened empires would cast their council vetoes only on the sincere belief that a particular resolution would significantly imperil the global community welfare. We do so only to then note that fairly early on, this hope and original charter intent was dashed, first by the Soviet Union and soon after by the United States, establishing precedents of casting vetoes to do nothing more than protect their exclusive foreign policy interests and allies. As Kenneth Roth recently observed regarding Syria, Quote, 
One frustrating element of the Security Council structure is that it permits the five permanent members to use their vetoes to block action for any reason, partisan or parochial, even in the case of mass atrocities, close quote. And thus, there subsequently arise short-lived debates about whether the use of the veto can be limited under the law of the Charter, ending in negative futility from P5 refusals and barriers. For example, Recently, in the current UN narrative refining the R2P principle, the Secretary General urged the P5 to publicly and voluntarily commit to refrain from casting vetoes of any Chapter 7 resolution authorizing R2P intervention for credible, well-grounded reasons. That recommendation is still pending. A second continuing issue is that of the limits of Security Council legal authority. We are all familiar with the Lockerbie case, which gave the ICJ an opportunity to rule on this issue, which it promptly deflected. A longer strand of argument holds that council authority is necessarily limited by the Charter Articles 1 and 2, Purposes and Principles of the United Nations. This argument has never been either refuted or confirmed due to the wide constitutive text of those articles, as well as the proposition that while the argument could ultimately be valid, the Council has not yet been perceived to act at the limits of whatever authority Articles 1 and 2 might represent. More might be done with this question, given the right opportunity for a Southern Tier actor to actually and concretely frame an argument of counsel ultra viris by action or inaction in a particular situation involving Articles 1 and 2, but this has not yet happened. But these issues do not comprise a normative assessment of the council's decision making in exercising collective authority to authorize R2P or other military intervention in particular states which are most likely uh, located in the southern tier. We must focus on the question of the corruption of the Council by either the P5 collectively or by the United States as the sole great power in alliance with other P5 members. That question goes to whether the Council's decision making is so dominated by any or all of the P5 that significant decisions, especially under Chapter 7, can best be understood as consistently implementing the national foreign policy and security goals of one or more P5 members using international law under the Charter as its vehicle and not as the exercise of lawful global collective authority to use force within the world community. The collective P5 drive to intervene in the southern tier through the vehicle of international law and the Charter has seemingly gotten so determined and intense that it overwhelms the normal issues about the interplay of P5 foreign policy and the obligations of each such country in the Council. The corruption here is of the very notion of collective authority under modern international law. The masquerade of national power and aims being cloaked by the forms of collective decision making to reach public conclusions of the legality of military or other, and other strategies against target states only reaffirms the corruption. Such corruption destroys this vital global safeguard against arbitrary military force, which notions of collective authority were evolved over more than a century to create, and to further guard against international legal prescription governing critical values being corrupted at the core of the authorizing process by the cloaked aims of unilateral national power. Further, this corruption raises even more profound questions. As the Council is corrupted by P5 foreign policy aims, we must know that these aims cannot be understood apart from these states' active shaping of the legal history of international law. The global north-south domination subordination narrative, the continuing narratives of colonialist and neo-colonial aims and policies being extended from the era of legal colonialism by policies and actions of the same now ex-metropolitan states towards the same territories of their ex-colonies and subordinated peoples. They cannot be understood apart from continuing aims to extend control under international law from the north into the south 
to not only protect foreign investment secure resources for the national needs and protect their exclusive security claims, but equally to use that lawful control to deflect accountability for global problems, inequities, and crimes from north to south, and to block that accountability from even in part being returned to the north. Moreover, this corruption is not addressed by proposals for Security Council procedural reforms towards a duty to decide or explain, such as made by Professor Spain. Though such reforms might provide more grounds for Council ultra viris issues under the purposes and principles of the Charter. Permanent members council's aims cannot be understood apart from their behaviors and public perspectives attempting to use the human rights process to continue the northern colonial civilizing mission towards southern peoples as shown by Macau Matua by favoring doctrines and interpretation urging those peoples to be ashamed of their own cultures in favor of neoliberal principles friendly to foreign investment being labeled as democracy and by finding jurisprudential excuses to undermine the legal authority of essential economic, social, and cultural rights. They cannot be understood apart from their general opposition to obligations of reparations for past colonial and racial wrongs to oppressed Southern peoples, which were so clearly sponsored, financed, and largely implemented by Northern metropolitans beginning with the international slave trade. These aims, finally, cannot be understood apart from the international legal history of permissible doctrines of diplomatic and other forms of intervention from legal colonialism forward being evolved to legalize the coercion of southern tier political cooperation and their resources, plus to force their recognition of northern hegemonic authority and the superiority of northern sovereign state authority over southern sovereign state authority. And not only is the council's collective authority used to certify <clears throat> the legality of northern jus ad bellum inter intervention actions, but also often after the fact to certify the jus in bello legalities of the same actions as they move into a later stage. The latter occurs even when the council manages by a P5 split to retain and exercise truly collective authority to refuse to authorize a clearly illegal intervention such as the 2003 invasion and conquest by the United States of Iraq that was refused under resolution 1441. There, a basic question was whether the United States was guilty of the crime of aggressive war and colonial conquest. Security Council resolutions beginning almost immediately after the invasion constructed a fig leaf for the United States against such crimes by, in its quasi-judicial role, finding that Iraq retained its sovereignty and was not reduced to a colony, notwithstanding the total destruction of its government by the U.S., the complete military occupation of its entire territory, and the U.S. construction of several years of occupation regimes synonymous with American goals and policies. So if the Security Council is corrupted at the very heart of its collective authority under the Charter by the domination aims of its permanent members, we must consider alternatives for governing the legality of military intervention, particularly as such intervention tends to be planned and launched in the North and targeted, implemented, and pushed towards Northern approved consequences in the South. Even if we have no immediate constitutive alternative to the Council under the Charter, we must consider, only, even if only to accurately assess the cost, whether it is wise and equitable policy in the progressive development of international law to continue to funnel collective authority decisions about such interventions through this body, especially under conditions of greatest potential human rights tragedy and need. It might be the better global policy to now adjust the legal balance between the council and regional organizations on authorizing enforcement actions under Article 53 of the Charter towards confirming regional authority to initially authorize such claims, particularly in providing legal, uh, needed emergency responses to imminent human rights catastrophes in a regional state, whether or not such response is invited by that government. In practice, except for Kosovo, there has been either ex ante or ex post hoc Security Council action that implied approval for such regional interventions, even regarding the ECOWAS intervention led by Nigeria into Liberia and Sierra Leone. 
However, an African Union treaty provision seems to authorize the African Union to authorize enforcement actions independently of the Security Council. Its enactment can be understood as a direct response to UN inaction on the Rwandan genocide. For emergency responses to impending human rights catastrophes, Article 53 needs to be interpreted towards the legality of such operations, especially where the Security Council has not or cannot act timely. As we see, the policy aim of giving the Council the sole charter competence to authorize enforcement actions in the world community vis-a-vis -vis regional organizations, a debate which arose in the San Francisco Conference, is now, due to the corruption of the Council, increasingly a problem. Not only do P5 veto battles often prevent the Council from making timely authorizing decisions in urgent situations, but the racialized biases that permanent members bring to questions of intervention in the southern tier risk insufficient strategies and neo-colonial responses when the, charter, when the council does exercise collective authority. One possible interpretive remedy would be to confirm the initial competence of regional organizations to authorize enforcement actions in regional situations of imminent human rights catastrophe under a presumption of council approval of such emergency actions, even if the regional organization thus shares with the council the authority to infringe Article 2.4 of the Charter. The burden would then be on the Council and the P5 to subsequently disown the regional action. The corruption of the Security Council makes it impossible to wait for effective and just Security Council reform in order to interpret international law to implement more just and equitable actions of military rights protective intervention into any state. Other sources of collective authority which promise better safeguards against dominating and racializing national state behavior relative to decisions about military intervention must be found. This now brings us to the bundle of issues and emerging norms known as responsibility to protect, R2P already mentioned. As an emerging norm of permissibility for outside states to intervene in a state, in the midst of or imminently facing tragic violations of the human rights of its citizens under collective authority or unilateral obligation, there is much confusion here. And we must note that R2P comprises claims and expectations that northern tier states will generally, even if not exclusively, be intervening in southern tier states under the rubric of preventing human rights tragedies. There are no expectations, for example, that Nigeria will be intervening in Spain under African Union authority or unilaterally to prevent major rights crimes towards the Basque people, or that the United States will be intervening in Australia to remedy racial tragedies against Aboriginal peoples. That northern states generally have superior resources to project military force in the implementation of global authority compared to southern states only sharpens without resolving R2P issues. It cannot be a prong of neutral analysis, particularly when this capacity is linked with northern tier control or near control over key international organizational processes and decisions authorizing the lawful use of force beginning with the Security Council. Thus, R2P risks providing another doctrinal framework for the North to leverage and control decisions about using force or other coercion to enforce human rights law and then to exercise additional leverage to secure what Southern agreement is possible in order to claim global legitimacy. This risk must be compared to the Northern and Southern tier evolving to share equal authority to determine lawful use of force in particular situations, whether in northern or southern states, and to determine liability for such human rights violations. We must also step back and understand the R2P doctrine as an historical successor to the old doctrine of humanitarian intervention, quite possibly as another north to south projection of international legal authority. It comprises legal permission to intervene to rescue and protect local endangered persons. However, there is a doctrinal distinction. R2P is grounded on the rights of people to be protected from human rights tragedy, while the old abused humanitarian intervention was grounded on one state's right to intervene in another.
We do not yet know if the north-south R2P consequences will be more globally equitable and the recent Libyan situation through the Security Council invoking R2P is not encouraging. Regarding humanitarian intervention, we should briefly recall various claims about its legality under the UN Charter because similar issues must be resolved about the use of at least unilateral military force under R2P, also under the Charter. Proponents of humanitarian intervention argued it as a doctrine of customary law, which the Charter did not abrogate, a customary river running beneath the Charter, as indeed the ICJ holding in Nicaragua versus U.S. permits. Specifically, unilateral humanitarian intervention represented a use of non-consensual military force intervening in a target state. Let us recall the Charter goals to change international law to limit permissible uses of force by a state to one, self-defense under Article 51, which to a degree incorporates customary law, including in anticipatory self-defense under the Caroline case, but not preemptive self-defense, are two, that military force be authorized by Security Council decision. The Charter aim was to abolish war as authorization for military force and channel unilateral permissibility into a single self-defense grant of international constitutive authority. Unilateral force otherwise was to be illegal, including under Article 2.4 for violating the territorial integrity or political independence of a state, contrary to UN purposes and principles. The issue becomes whether and on what legal basis can we add R2P as a unilateral or non-Security Council authorized use of force as a new and additional permission under the Charter not amounting to self-defense to use unilateral force within a foreign sovereign state. The customary law argument for R2P does not apply, at least not yet, and not without more clarified evidence of a global consensus. Is it wise to then claim that a second, newer customary river permitting unilateral force runs beneath the Charter, thus opening the door to defining a third and fourth such rivers? This threatens to become a recipe for expanding the permissibility of national state military force to pre-charter levels, approaching mere foreign policy objectives. It would compromise the foundational aim of international law to reduce military conflict both among and within states. And given that the majority of the 30 or so states which have effective capacities to project military force well beyond their borders lie in the northern tier, this is a recipe for expanding permissible northern intervention into and onto southern peoples. Let me reflect for a moment on Rwanda. A proposed doctrine of R2P arose into the international community expectations following the Rwanda genocide. The failure of the Arusha Accords in 1992-93 leading to that tragedy relative to the collectively authorized peacekeeping effort by the UN Security Council demonstrates that the opportunity of existing UN peacekeeping military forces in Rwanda are under our individual national military forces to halt or mitigate the predicted oncoming planned and directed genocide was not taken. It was not taken because the European dominated Security Council P5 imposed a great reduction of those forces to the point of ineffectiveness. Thus, Rwanda shows that if the Security Council authorized collective authority is the preferred legal mode of implementation of R2P, moving as it would from north to south, the Council cannot be depended on to overcome the foreign policy interests of the P5 and enable itself as a lawgiver to effectively decide on sufficiently strong and timely military force here already in the country to halt a planned and directed genocide. The Council's response was indeed to weaken such forces and to make it clear that they were not to interfere. A stronger force could have mitigated or prevented the killing of up to one million civilians. This failure of Northern control response to this genocide in the Council as the arena of Northern decisional and international legal preference indicates first 
that the P5 retain the deficits within the Council of racialized international law towards the southern tier, notwithstanding the most serious crimes converging with northern availability of military capacity. Second, it indicates that this P5 UN failure in the quintessential R2P situation frames anew the issue of the legality of unilateral intervention in an imminent danger R2P situation. This is particularly so since the P5 UN response in Rwanda at the critical point arguably violated the purposes and principles of the UN Charter by deliberately neutering the Council and allowing a predicted genocide. Thus, this history challenges the asserted policy preference of the Council as the primary R2P lawgiver regarding collective authority to protect people facing human rights catastrophes. The challenge is not resolved by the Libyan action based on the Council's interpretation of R2P because clearly the majority of P5 foreign policy interests favor getting rid of Gaddafi at the first opportunity and if by collective authorization, so much the better. The subsequent apologies of several northern and UN international leaders who publicly wished ex post that they had done more in the face of their own clear realistic capacity to act, to interrupt or perhaps even prevent that horrific Rwanda genocide rang somewhat hollow. But they did lead to proposals for an obligatory doctrine of intervention binding on states in a position to do so to halt ongoing or impending human rights atrocities and not lesser degrees of violation, however understood. Various proposals followed in the UN system. But fairly quickly, this version of R2P was challenged by the issue of whether such intervention to, protect, to prevent human rights atrocities must only lie under some collective exercise of authority, desirably the UN Security Council, but perhaps, as in Africa, for Sierra Leone by regional authority. These ambiguities have been debated to and fro until the Libyan question before the Security Council in 2012. <coughs> There, the Council acting under Chapter 7 authority and under its quasi-judicial authority prescribed in finding Libyan government actions to be a threat to international peace and security, that government's duty under international law to protect its citizens and refrain from causing them deadly harm and described that duty as responsibility to protect. Thus, this doctrine became a standing duty of state governments to refrain from deadly harm to their citizens, enforceable by Security Council collective authorization of outside military and state military intervention under the Charter. R2P was thus narrowed from its original unilateral intervention context. The issue of critical importance of deployment time was submerged in favor of debate and decision by the Northern Control Security Council, and the risk was added of one or more permanent member vetoes abrogating any intervention, no matter how horrific the facts on the ground. It is true that R2P has now been quasi-judicially prescribed by the Council as a doctrinal duty on all state governments to refrain from deadly harm to their citizens, particularly to ensure their own regime survival. <clears throat> Excuse me. But we now see that this prescription <clears throat> is in danger of becoming sui generis and attracting no precedential authority as the Security Council both refuses and may be unable to apply it to other similar or worse situations, as is now the case with Syria. The R2P doctrine may be available to levy against the Assad regime, but any intervention to prevent or mitigate the carnage on the ground against Syrian citizens is bottled up in the narrowness of vetoes and the post-Libyan international legal doctrine. Where, even in theory, do we go from here? So let me turn to a final proposal. In the recent Libyan situation, R2P was prescribed, as, we, as I've just discussed, as a duty on all states to protect their citizens from state harm. And its violation was invoked by the Security Council as a threat to international peace and security by the Libyan government. But that invocation was inextricable from the proto-colonial narrative running through the Security Council process. Military force was authorized against Libya to be carried out <clears throat> by three ex-colonial metropolitans, the Italians, the British, and the French, of Libyan territory when it was a colony, through council decision-making, 
where at least three of the P5 states had their own long-standing foreign policy reasons for removing Gaddafi as a national leader. African initiatives for a more negotiated approach to the situation were roundly rebuffed, while the Arab League gave the Council reluctant support, which was quickly claimed in northern narratives to legitimize the entire operation. However, answering the legal challenge of these situations, where an immediate military response to an imminent human rights catastrophe may well necessarily have to be, in the short term, a unilateral military response, as would likely have been the case in Rwanda, seems to involve R2P as an emerging doctrine that would give a limited unilateral legal permission to use military force to avoid a human rights catastrophe. <clears throat> the question then becomes, what shifts can be made to mitigate the racializing dangers of R2P and its projected implementation in this regard as between the northern and southern tier? There is cons a considerable process of legal development in the United Nations, particularly involving the General Assembly and the Office of the Secretary General, focused on R2P as an emerging legal doctrine. One notable outcome is the limitation of the coverage of the doctrine to situations involving genocide and other stated international crimes. We can ask whether this limitation will help curtail potential north to south racializing abuses under R2P as well as help universalize the R2P norm of preventing human rights catastrophes in both the northern and southern tier. But a more immediate task in this regard is to separate decisions about military action by northern officials from assessments and recognition of the imminence of a human rights catastrophe in a particular state or situation. In other words, we must assure, ensure the authority of the Caroline requirement to, of imminence as a permissive condition to use military force. This task particularly arises around the current Security Council related issues of first, the authority of a Security Council Chapter 7 veto blocking military or other council action following discussion of a situation threatening international peace and security where there are either strong expectations by key P5 members of council military authorization in which they would play a key role or strong international community expectations that the council should authorize forceful action. Much interpretation has arisen about the permission given by a council veto for action nonetheless by, for example, coalitions of the willing organized by the strength and will of the United States for action, such as in Iraq in 2003. Similarly, <clears throat> following Kosovo and NATO action lacking council approval, there followed scholarly interpretations that the military action was, quote, lawful but legitimate. Close quote. The latter bifurcation, while understandable, raised more unanswered questions about interpreting both the UN Charter and general international law. Thus the question becomes that of regulating the determination of one or more P5 members and other states who were primed for their own military action and wished it to be collectively authorized, but it was not, and therefore they remained determined and rationalized to carry it through nonetheless. The companion question is that of regulating state and public international demands for military action considered legitimate to forestall a human rights tragedy, but with collective authorization blocked by the wrong-headed veto failure of the Council. To address both of these latter questions, I propose that dedicated authority to make assessments and formally certify the imminence of a human rights catastrophe anywhere in the world community and only to publicly broadcast and recognize the imminence of such uh, impending horrors be lodged in the UN Department of Peacekeeping Operations, DPKO, as it is linked to the Secretary General. The DPKO already possesses clear capacity towards such global monitoring in its responsibilities to do assessments of threatening conflicts in advance of forthcoming Security Council discussion in providing the Secretary General with necessary Council information as well as in assessing the requirements of implementing peacekeeping operations authorized by the Council. Part of that process already 
is the convoking by the Secretary General independently of the Security Council and its mandates of strategic assessments of, a pin, of impending situations that include relevant resources and information from elsewhere in the UN Secretariat and which may be followed by the dispatch of special envoys for further assessment of the situation. All of this strongly suggests especially with, this, with additional resources, that the DPKO, in conjunction with the Secretary General and upon his authority, could perform the global monitoring necessary to timely and publicly proclaim the imminence of a human rights catastrophe arising anywhere in the world community, especially a planned and directed genocide or other R2P-stated international crimes. It further suggests that this department is sufficiently independent of undue corrupting pressures by member states for it to do this critically important job. However, now the DPKO must ensure that its monitoring and assessment function is equally extended to the northern tier, following the precedent of the universal periodic review of the internal human rights conditions of all states and the growing precedence of UN human rights reports for conditions in the United States and elsewhere in the North. This extension is critical to mitigate the racializing of the RCP, R2P process. Operationally, the DPKO under this proposal, having hopefully learned its lessons since Rwanda, would certify where no other timely options through the UN or elsewhere could be mobilized, that a human rights catastrophe was imminent in a particular state and that its government was unwilling or unable to protectively respond. This would be a loud global certification, perhaps analogous to a global in imminent tsunami warning with the full weight of the Secretary General behind it. Only upon that certification of imminence of a human rights catastrophe featuring international crimes would any unilateral national state or states in a position to timely and appropriately deploy rights protected military force to the designated state acquire the legal authority to so intervene for the sole purpose of preventing or mitigating the rights catastrophe until further international assistance could arrive, including that authorized by the council or by a regional organization. Such DPKO certification of eminence would only be a precondition and itself would create no right or duty on the states to respond. However, in addition to the halting of R2P international crimes already having been confirmed as an obligation erga omnis, military and territorial factors plus the contextual relationship of the unilateral actors to the targeted territory and its people would shape the unilateral state's duty to act to mitigate or prevent the impending catastrophic crimes. Should that state now fail to respond where its capacity to do so is apparent, global demands would hopefully arise for it to immediately justify its refusing its duty to protect those endangered people on behalf of the international community. Those states responding would be bound by international humanitarian law where there is military conflict and also by international human rights law where applicable. An important part of their global accountability would be an assessment of the strategies and aims of their military deployments. The latter must be tailored for preventing a human rights catastrophe and delivering the humanitarian assistance and protection of local people directly implied and not for prevailing in a civil war and shaping the governance of the country for other ends, and then tailored to withdraw once the catastrophe is prevented and other suitable international assistance arise. To define the legal basis for any country using unilateral force under this proposal requires us to recall that the legal norm of R2P emphasizes the needs of the victims to be protected rather than an alleged right of intervention. We must address the issue of unilateral military responses to claimed human rights catastrophes for at least three reasons. One, because of the inevitability that some states will sometimes claim a right to do so in relationship or not to Security Council action and therefore the need for better international legal regulation of this issue. Two, the history of collective authorization for emergency human rights responses being often that of such authorization coming, if at all, quite late to actually prevent the potential victims, on, to actually pre 
protect the potential victims on the ground are not coming at all because of P5 conflicting politics and racializing aims blocking the Security Council action under Chapter 7, in addition to similar possible delays in regional organizations. And three, sometimes timely, properly deployed, Military action, even by a single state, is the only effective first stage hope for threatened people in an R2P situation. There are already proposals being made in the legal relationship between the Council under Chapter 7 and regional organizations under Chapter 8 of the Charter for carving out exceptions for regional military action in emergency R2P situations. This proposal advocates the acceleration of that process with the inclusion of these DPKO certified conditions and safeguards. I have previously suggested that regional organizations might authorize enforcement action in emergency R2P situations under a presumption of post hoc Security Council approval. I now expand that recommendation to the regional level to cover presumptive regional authorization if it is not given timely per the DPKO certification of imminence for a single or few states in a position for an immediate properly deployed military response for R2P prevention. They would exercise their duty to unilaterally act to prevent a criminal a catastrophe. The burden would first be on the regional organization to disown, if it wishes, the unilateral R2P protective mission and then on the Security Council. I suggest that disowning such actions that are uniquely triggered by DPKO certifications of eminence that are publicly and properly deployed for only that purpose and whose deployment quickly includes publicized goals, arrangements, and timetables for military action and then withdraw from the territory after averting or mitigating a catastrophe would rarely happen. Thus, the legal basis for unilateral action would primarily rest on the emerging authority of regional organizations to order enforcement actions only in emergency R2P situations and the implied regional authorization to those unilateral state actors deploying military force subsequent to DPKO certifications of imminence. Any implied Security Council approval post hoc would only support that legality. More risky arguments might also be made on the legality of this emergency unilateral R2P action based on General Assembly or other appropriate process of limited reinterpretation of Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the UN Charter. The reinterpretation would be that this unilateral use of force against a designated state for this R2P purpose and only under these DPKO certified conditions and safeguards presumptively does not constitute a threat to the territorial integrity or political independence of the intervened in state. Such tightly defined action upholds the charter human rights obligations, constitutes a valid emergency exception absent Security Council action not otherwise addressed by the charter, and therefore constitutes a lawful use of limited unilateral force under the charter. Professor D'Amato has shown how the Charter Cavo supports such an interpretation of Article 2.4. All in all, this proposed legal basis for unilateral R2P DPKO certified emergency military intervention and for regional organizations authorizing enforcement action for the same purpose represents more desirable international community policy than the current northern-led debates on the authority to act militarily conferred by a Security Council veto refusal of Chapter 7 decisions to authorize protective military action and than the dilemma for international lawyers following Kosovo of designating emergency catastrophe mitigating regional action absent council authorization as illegal but legitimate. Again, the DPKO and the Secretary General must be equally prepared and willing to give such global certifications of eminence to situations in the northern tier where its timely assessments requires. If no outside military forces respond, the threatened people within a northern state will at least gain some added local protection plus other possible globally mobilized strategies of non-military intervention from this special global spotlight focused on their oppression. And in conclusion, it's an open question whether international law will only bless current patterns of power regarding north to south practices of intervention, 
or whether better international law will resolve this challenge through a less racialized process. The power of human rights is hopeful, but insufficient without more incorporation of the lessons of the decolonization movement and without R2P successfully emerging as a non-racialized norm of protection in imminently catastrophic situations. The United Nations, in spite of the Security Council in its current process, must play an important safeguarding role. I always hold out hope for better international law. Thank you. So, good heavens, are we fortunate. Uh, a lot, a lot to think about here. Professor Richardson raises, at its most basic, a fundamental conflict. A conflict between our human motivations, basic human motivations, to save innocent people from slaughter, to avoid imminent, catastrophic human rights abuses, to protect against widespread displacement of peoples and people on the one hand. And on the other, Professor Richardson reminds us of important historical contexts, contexts founded in power and the abuse of power. Professor Richardson often offered us a variety of different historical events that cause skepticism about our motivations, about our intuitions. I might add a few more. The use ad, bello, ad bellum concept, of course, goes back to the fifth century, reaffirmed by Thomas Aquinas in the 1200s, Grotius in the 1600s, and refined much later. But going all the way back to the 14 and 1500s, Spain and other colonial powers used these very notions to justify the brutalization of indigenous populations. France, Great Britain, and Russia used it again in the 1800s to pursue what some might call religious wars against the Ottoman Muslims. All of this creates great skepticism about our own intuitions. Skepticism that might lead us to question human rights because of the mechanisms by which we enforce or protect human rights. In other words, we have a good idea that butts up against reality. A reality that international law is a reflection, is a distillation, and thus includes an embedded nature of power. And perhaps, well, to take it one step further, I should say, Professor Richardson, in essence, attacks the R2P child of humanitarian intervention at both the substance and the process. The substance of the idea, the motivation, our intuition, our basic human sense of morality that we ought to intervene to help others who are being harmed. Professor Richardson points out, however, that at its most basic, this idea is founded in motivation. Common descriptions, or perhaps even the common wisdom about R2P and humanitarian intervention more broadly, require that the motivation of the intervener be pure, that the motivation not be based on self-interest. But motivation, of course, is idiosyncratic. It is contingent, fleeting, temporary, and perhaps worst, subjective. And ultimately, those with motivations can't act without power. So Professor Richardson reminds us 
that who are the actors in the interventions? Those are the powerful, the powerful states. Those with the hammers do the hammering. And for me, at least, what I found most powerful from Professor Richardson's comments was that he attacks the solution, the prevailing solution. The prevailing solution is we need to simply trust the UN Security Council. There is the process of law, the process of legalizing intervention. And he reminds us, if you excuse the pun, reminds us powerfully that that process is, to use his words, corrupt. Corrupt in the sense that it, too, is a reflection, is a historical distillation of power. But paradoxically, this is the solution of most international lawyers. The solution is we simply turn to the legitimizing the legalizing, actually to use a better word, the legalizing process of Chapter 7 of the UN Charter and more specifically the actions of the Security Council. So what do we do about this? What do we do about this seemingly insoluble conflict? Well, first of all, it calls for our skepticism. The existing situation calls for our skepticism. And it calls us to ask questions like, was Kosovo, was the intervention in Kosovo, a long-term good idea? Yes, I mean that as provocatively as I said it. Our solution Professor Richardson ultimately reminds us, is the law. And perhaps one of the worst, for my, actually, I'll take it from my, my perspective, one of the things about which I worry most, uh, most commonly and most fundamentally in our discussions of international law is there are way too many arguments and way too, way too little law. Professor Richardson reminds us that we have a lawmaking gap. Not only a legal gap, a lawmaking gap. And we need more law, not more good arguments. We need, in other words, good lawyers. Professor Richardson reminds us, if you excuse the congratulation, of the importance of us reminds us of the importance of careful, critical, structured, legal thinking, not political thinking. And yes, perhaps even less policy and less policy thinking. Professor Richardson provides, actually offers, a solution, a solution that would locate out of the Security Council important fact-finding responsibilities. Locating with the DPKO the authority to make factual determinations that would justify the, what he properly identifies as necessary unilateral interventions based on facts determined by an independent body. The one tweak I would add, or perhaps the one offer of perspective on Professor Richardson's proposed solution, is that that too must be a legal solution. We must have processes that lead to this solution being a legal solution, and not simply another round of customary international law argumentation. But with that, I'll conclude by saying thank you. Thank you for being provocative. <laughs>
We also, as lawyers, have our own group think, and we need to be provoked. So thank you for the provocation. Thank you for the reminder, reminder of truths that are uncomfortable to hear. And if, in fact, we can transform the argumentation into law, we will, in fact, really make a stride forward to support our motivations, our intuitions, and channel them to a legal solution to this problem. Professor Richardson, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Van Alstein. Uh, yeah, well, I, I don't know about you guys, but I was uh, pretty blown away by the keynote uh, address. Lots of big ideas out there. And just for my own personal comment, I saw uh, this morning in the panel discussion, we saw that there was uh, some shortcomings in the, in the international law system and that the default, uh, the default solution in the way of uh, the shortcomings of the law is to fall back to politics, because it's what's necessary. Uh, and to resolve uh, to resolve conflicts as they come up, but you know what Professor Richardson reminds us of is that we have to be wary of our politics and what ideas uh, you know we're going to naturally fall back to. So with that in mind, uh, we have uh, we're, we're running a little bit over, but I think we have time for uh, some questions if anybody has some. Professor Gray. So I. Gen the uh, Security General's Office was consulted, involved, and utterly 
um, impotent in the face of that threat. And if the dominant theme that you're pressing is that we find plenty of justification where northern motivations play a role, but a lack of justification where they don't, um, then I wonder whether that same practical circumstance might replay itself, but now in the DPKO instead of the Security Council. <clears throat> Is this microphone? Don't know how much ammunition I should bring with me. <laughs> um, it sounds like one of my questions. It's a single question, it just has parts. <laughs> um, if I understood your, your first question, um, if I gave the impression that I was, with respect to my R2P discussion, or for that matter, my analysis generally, that I was calling for a purity of intent of intervening actors, um, then that was some miscommunication on my part. What I was uh, focusing on was a historical process that has embedded itself in international law that is larger than the question of intent. Uh, I don't believe there are any angels in this process. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, with respect to um, uh, analyzing R2P, uh, the question is one of evolving legal doctrine that uh, better channels and also uh, mitigates uh, destructive consequences uh, rather than ensuring um, purity of, of intent. Um, I was, I must confess, driven uh, to the recognition of the necessity of allowing in limited cases unilateral military intervention most reluctantly uh, because of uh, the potential for abuse and I hope that I made, I hope I made that clear. But um, I, I could not especially given the Rwanda case, and I've spent some time in Rwanda, I, I could not simply get around the necessity of military force at particular key moments if those moments could be identified and responded to. Uh, I can think of no, uh, in those 100 days, or, in, or beginning in day 105 to day uh, I mean, beginning in day zero minus five to day 100 in the Rwandan genocide. Uh, I, have, I can think of no negotiating strategy, right, or even economic strategy, as far as I know anything about the situation, that would have halted that genocide, right? Um, so, um, now, in terms of international law uh, being framed are being assessed for its success on whether it can limit might makes right. Um, I think that's a, 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 a two or three part uh, question and answer. Um, and I think we have to separate prescription from enforcement. Um, uh, as I uh, Ask my students, the murder conviction rate in the United States is something on the order of 47% thereabouts, which does not tempt anybody to um, abolish uh, uh, the law prohibiting murder. Um, prescriptively, or for that matter, uh, even because of less than 50% enforcement. Um, I think the same is true with respect to international law. That's one reason, for example, why I highlighted the Nicaragua case 
and the court preserving the notion of violation, notwithstanding that non-intervention as a doctrine factually um, is violated. There's no doubt about it, uh, to a certain extent, and sometimes to a large extent. Uh, notwithstanding that the enforcement question is often posed as a question of all of the processes, as a, as a test of all of the processes of international law. Well, why can't international law prevent the United States as a great power from doing X? Well, because powerful actors in all legal systems cannot be prevented if they're bound and determined to do X. What international law can do uh, is hopefully uh, raise not only raise the costs, but attract a number of remedies and call them right, as opposed to the exercise of power. Um, and so, my, you know, putting limits on might makes right, I think, is only one of the tasks of international law. And the first limit to be put is a normative limit. And it's not a secret why, first, um, part of the dominance of the North is because of the balance of universities and law schools in the North. This is beginning to even out a bit, right? Um, and this, this is, um, has a, a, a decided impact with respect to the generation of theory, uh, the generation of doctrine, the formation of jurisprudence, the formation, the decision as to whether or not uh, jurisprudence in a certain area of international law formation will be excusatory as to what interests uh, or will be um, costly as to what interests and so forth. Um, so I, I, I'm not uh, believing that any success of R2P to emerge as um, a doctrine relatively free of racializing, and I say relatively, because I, I have no illusions that this is a complete solution because international law is a process. It's a process right, of decision and norms uh, and decision making and so forth. Uh, but it seems to me that um, the DPKO uh, proposal um, might deflect some of the harmful uh, issues and some of the harmful consequences into less harmful channels. Right, at least, at least for the, for the moment. Um, now, with respect to um, United States intervening in Australia or not to protect Aboriginal peoples, or Nigeria intervening in in in, in Spain, um, I agree with you that the the lack of international law enforcement in northern states is not a set off. Right, against the need to enforce international law uh, in southern states. Uh, this question, for example, you know, finds uh, one focus under, um, in, in the current discussion with respect to the International uh, uh, Criminal Court uh, and the fact, the debate as to whether or not it's a mere historical accident that all of the court's prosecutions so far uh, are of African uh, states. Um, and that none of its investigations with respect to other interests have ripened. Um, I, I don't, I, I believe there are historical forces that are working that go beyond um, mere expressions of intent or intention. I think they go to constellation of interests and if indeed one sees a former uh, British foreign secretary flatly saying that the International Criminal Court was not established to prosecute European cases, one begins uh, to suspect. Having said this, right, um, what needs to be guarded against is that international legal enforcement in the southern tier, particularly when done by northern intervenors, right, is not a process of saving the victims from their own culture. Right. Um, it may be, a, it is a process of certainly protecting victims and their human rights, right? Um, but the notion of victimhood in the South, uh, 
right, is a, is a real problem and has been an excuse for intervention uh, by northern interests and, and northern perspectives for a long time. Um, I believe, for example, to go back to the International Criminal Court, uh, that one can find in the Rome Statute, uh, the particular provision escapes me at the moment, um, the court's equal authority with respect to its definition of, say, gravity of crimes, uh, for the court to take cases wherever they arise. Certainly not cases only described by numbers of mass victims, but by other definitions of international crimes that may have similar global consequences, even if they don't involve immediately the same number of mass victims as, say, African cases do. And somehow, uh, only one side of that equation, I believe, has been enforced. Um, uh, but I have, I have faith in the new prosecutor, um, Madam Bensua, Suda, of the International uh, uh, Court of, of the International Criminal Court, in that in that regard. Now, with respect to uh, whether um, I'm being naive, and I I deliberately stuck the phrase in there, that is to say, hoping that the DPKO had learned their lesson since Rwanda. A, one has to have some hope. B, uh, to the extent that the head of the DPKO at that time was Kofi Annan, uh, who indeed has not only has apologized, but I actually consider uh, other than perhaps Trigger Lee, certainly one of the two best secretary generals that has ever headed the UN. Um, and given the intervening history and the rise of R2PX expectations and the embedding of the refinement of R2P in the UN process, um, I guess I consider that a hope well founded. Um, whether or not that office, and this is a problem or an issue, as you know, for the entire UN, or for that matter, any international organization, bureaucracy or secretariat, as to the extent to which it's compromised by the cross-corruptive member pressures against the ideal of an international civil service. Um, what I've been able to find is that, uh, and that's, I think I put the word unduly in my, in my description here. Um, I, have, I have not found that this office is unduly vulnerable in this regard. Will it be a target? Certainly, if this proposal goes, yes, it will be. There's no doubt about it. Uh, will it depend upon the personality and, in some extent, maybe the courage of the Secretary General? Of course. No doubt about it. Uh, on the other hand, um, will it frame issues in a way that are not totally dependent upon the conjuries and, and uh, calculations uh, and rush to publicity of three or four northern intelligence agencies in certain respects? And is it equipped to do so? Uh, I think the answer is, to all of those questions is more positive right, than, than not. So, so in terms of potential vulnerability of the DPKO, I, you know, I, I, I agree with you. Um, but um, I think it's better than what we have, and I think it perhaps rearranges the issues in a favorable way. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Richardson. I'm sure <laughs> So the journal uh, got this, uh, put something together oh, for you. Oh, my goodness. So this is, uh, you know, addressed to you. This is the photo that we've gotten from uh, 
uh, for also to, uh, to promote our to promote our event and just thank you for your uh, thank you for your assistance and for your uh, for your comments and a lot of insight. Well, thank you very much.